Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Tennessee has one of the highest rates in the nation of women killed by men. Marie Varsos was one of those victims. It was around this time two years ago that her estranged partner, Sean Varsos, showed up at her mom's house in Lebanon and confronted Marie as she was leaving for work. She fought back, shooting him three times, but he still managed to kill both Marie, her mom Debbie Sisko, and then himself. Now, records show that before her death, Marie seemingly tried everything she could to prevent what she saw coming. Metro Nashville Police, Fire, and Medical. Yeah, hi, my name is Marie Varsos. I was able to call to get a police escort over to my place of residence since I have an order of protection. Yeah, my name is uh, Marie. I was going to read someone about a police report that I filed about a week ago in an order of protection that I had. Some- well, I was going to make sure my contact info was correct because those times when he was served with order of protection and when he was arrested, I never got a notification. In many ways, Marie had the odds stacked in her favor. Unlike many victims of domestic violence, she had a safe place to stay, family in town to advocate for her, and the time and resources to try and navigate the patchwork of Nashville's system. But it was not enough to save her. Today's episode is a rebroadcast of an episode we first aired this time last year. We'll dig deeper into the resources available and the constraints on them for survivors of domestic violence in our city and region. But first, let's spend some more time with Marie's case. Since April 2021, Marie's brother, Alex Yawn, has been taking matters into his own hands to try and figure out just how this could have happened to his sister in hopes of keeping it from happening to anyone else. WPLN's Paige Flaker has been following the story. She went with Alex to the state capitol last March and takes it from here. And without objection, we'll go out of session and hear from this gentleman. Sorry if you would, go ahead and... Alex Yon stands in front of a row of state representatives. He's wearing a dark blue suit, and he holds tightly to the sides of the podium, studying himself. The lawmakers were talking among themselves until Alex starts to speak. Uh, my name's Alex Yon, and I'm born and raised here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and last April, my mother, uh, Debbie Sisko, and my sister, Marie Varsos, were murdered by my brother-in-law. Uh, now... The room is silent. All eyes are fixed on him. I said about the process of trying to understand what, if anything, could have been done to save them. I wanted to make sure... I wanted to make sure that no one, no family, had to endure what we had to go through. This moment has been a year in the making for Alex. Over that time, he's interviewed more than a dozen officials, poured through hours of recordings. Almost everything you'll hear in this story came from Alex. He wanted to understand how his sister, someone who had access to resources and knew where to go for help, could still wind up dead. If she couldn't navigate the system, he wondered, who was it working for? Metro Nashville Police Fire and Medical. It all started the night of March 7th last year. It's about 9.30 at night, and Alex is sitting with Marie and their mom, Debbie, in a pickup truck outside of a police precinct. Oh, yes, I think I called and spoke to you earlier. I'm outside of the Hermitage Police Station. The doors are locked and the lights are off. Debbie is in the back seat comforting Marie. Bruises are starting to form around her neck, where her husband, Sean Varsos, strangled her until she passed out. She came to with a gun to her head. He had a gun and was threatening to kill himself and said that um, if officers were called, that he would shoot himself and that he has the names and address of all of her friends and would come after her and her family and friends. That's why Alex is on the phone, trying to get someone to come and take a police report. And they're working on getting out there to you. There's just nobody in the precinct right now. Um, So what's going to happen is a patrol car is going to have to free up from whatever they're doing and come to you. Got it. Um, And you sure your sister doesn't need an ambulance? I I know you said she was choked. Um, 
Is she okay? She, she does not need an ambulance. She does not need an ambulance at this time. But if that gets someone out here sooner, we will take it. Despite his urgency, minutes go by. Okay. I've seen six officers since we've been out here drive by. Only then hours. Alex tries calling again and again. Uh, sorry to sorry to keep calling, but just don't know what to do. Yep. So. Yep. Eventually, they drive to a different precinct. I understand, and I'm trying to be as appreciative and waiting as long as possible, but my sister was choked out to where she passed out, and her husband threatened to shoot her and has threatened to shoot himself. So my patience is gone. Did she find a report at that out. time? Did she get hospital? That's what we've been freaking trying to do. She hasn't I'm been to sorry. the hospital. We're trying to, we're trying to file a police that? report. Okay, I understand. Things didn't get better from there. This was just the first of many frustrating interactions that Marie and her family would have with law enforcement over the next month or so. I'm going to reach someone about a police report that I filed uh, about a week ago in an order of protection that I had some questions about. It's clear from calls like these that Marie knew what might be coming. She sought help, but it wasn't enough. And on April 12th, Sean did exactly what he threatened to do. He killed Marie, her mom, and then himself. It just hasn't seemed real, uh, and it still doesn't seem real, and it's been hard to sort of process it. Just like that, Alex lost his family, and the person he needed most was gone. I had a very, very deep relationship with my mother, and, um, you know, I would speak to her almost daily. You know, that person is no longer in my life, and that's been difficult um, to sort of realize and, and, and not have that. Alex was left to settle his family's estates, and in that process, he found something that would change everything. He remembers opening Marie's laptop. And there, by the trackpad, was a sticky note with her computer password on it. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way this is going to work. But it did. It was almost like a, a sign that she wanted me to have access to her computer. It turns out Marie had been documenting Sean's abuse and her efforts to escape it for a long time. She left notes to herself. There were messages she'd sent to her therapist, texts with Sean... She'd even recorded some of their fights and his threats. It sort of weirdly sort of turned into a solving a murder mystery. Marie had left a trail, and Alex decided he was going to follow it. He started dissecting that month, from the time his family first went to the police in March to when they were killed in April. And through that process, I discovered the irregularities, the loopholes, and the, and the failures in, in the system. First, he reached out to the agencies that touched his sister's case, the district attorney's office, the dispatchers, MMPD, the sheriff's office. Recording in progress. Maybe the best thing to do might be just to kind of go around for, for introductions. He interviewed them on Zoom from his apartment in San Francisco in hopes of understanding why it was so hard for Marie to get the help she needed. And it didn't take him long to stumble across one of the first problems she faced. The police had a warrant out for Sean's arrest, but he walked in and out of the sheriff's office with no trouble. And Sean's arrest only came after Marie alerted law enforcement of his location. Susan Tucker Smith with the district attorney's office told Alex this happens all the time. That has definitely been an issue that has come up many times is the separateness of the, of the work that the sheriff's department does and the work of the Metro Police. But that wasn't the only issue. Alex discovered Sean should have been held in jail for 12 hours, and Marie should have been notified of his release. Neither of those things happened. That's because the sheriff's office failed to sign her up for a victim notification system. Marie even called the non-emergency line to make sure they had gotten her phone number right. Arrested, I never got a notification or missed call or anything that that was that that happened. So I just want to make sure my contact info was correct first and foremost. Records do show that after Marie was killed, sheriff's employees were disciplined for both Sean's early release and failing to sign Marie up for those notifications. But the discovery Alex is really stuck on, the court could have ordered a GPS tracker for Sean, so Marie would know where he was. 
that's the one thing that could have saved my mother and sister's life. That day that Sean killed Marie and her mother, they didn't know it, but he was sitting outside of their house in a rental car for 45 minutes, waiting with guns, a taser, and zip ties. I know that wasn't the first time that he was out there. And if he had a GPS monitor on him that could have alerted my sister or law enforcement, they probably would have been here still today. Instead, Marie walked out of the house right into a trap. Alex later asked Assistant DA Christina Johnson how often GPS trackers are even used in domestic violence cases here in Davidson County. Qualify for that, or if they're even considered. I um, have not seen them put on domestic violence cases. Alex is completely overwhelmed by just how many times his sister was let down by the system. For them, they view it as one thing that went wrong in their agency, but coupled together, they're like eight things that went wrong, you know, for this person who was dealing with uh, the government to try and get the help that they needed. My fear is that if someone were to be assaulted right now tonight, that I think that they might still experience some of the same problems that, that we experienced. That fear that what happened to Marie is happening to other victims right now in Tennessee is what led Alex to the state capitol last month. I ask and plead with you to help address these loopholes by supporting two bills today, actually. I realize this won't bring my mother and sister back, but I hope that it will help save others. And I thank you all for your time. He's fighting for four bills that he feels would have helped protect his family. One would close that gap in communication between sheriff's deputies and police. Right now, it's on the governor's desk. Another would require GPS monitoring. It's clear Alex's story is getting through to some lawmakers, but some still have concerns, like Senator Mike Bell. Horrible situations sometimes can make bad law if you try to fix a horrible, horrible situation with a general law that applies all over. And so I'm, I'm just telling you, as I look at this, I'm, I'm hearing the, your, your pain and seeing this horrible situation, uh, but I also want to make sure that we don't create any unintended consequences. Bell would later be one of four senators to vote against Alex's GPS bill. You know, this is the sausage making, you know, that no one likes, but it's progress nonetheless. In the hall outside of the Senate hearing room, Alex takes a moment to catch his breath. Worn out, tired, um, want to get some rest and then figure out, you know, what the next stages are. A lot of people now know, you know, know what's at stake and know the bills and know who I am and know my mother and sister's story, and I think that that's part of it. There's no clean victory here, but even after a long, hard day of testifying and a year of digging for answers, Alex still has hope, hope that the system might eventually change, even if it's not today. That came to us from WPLN criminal justice reporter Paige Flager. Since this story first aired last April, Paige has continued to investigate loopholes in the system for domestic violence victims. She's teaming up with ProPublica to tell stories about people like Marie Varsos, who was shot and killed with a gun that the perpetrator should not have had access to. If you know someone affected by this issue, we want to hear from you to power our investigation. Email us at thisisnashville at wpln.org. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue this re-air, and we're going to get into those four bills that Alex Yawn has been fighting for and find out what community advocates have to say about the resources available to survivors of domestic violence. Stay with us. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. 
Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. This hour, we're bringing you a rebroadcast of an episode that first aired this time last year, all about domestic violence. Before the break, we heard about the efforts of Alex Yawn to get laws passed to create enhanced protections for survivors of domestic violence. Alex is the brother of Marie Varsos and the son of Deborah Sisko. Both were killed by Marie's estranged partner. We kick off this segment with Christina Johnson, Davidson County Assistant District Attorney and team leader of the Domestic Violence Unit. Christina, welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you for having me, Kello. So I understand that you didn't work on this case directly, but I'm just curious, what stood out to you as you listened to that story? Uh, it's just tragic. The story is tragic. And I, I, I want to start by thanking Alex for all of the, the hard work that he's put into trying to point out ways in which the systems can work together better so that we can help support survivors um, and people that are currently being victimized by domestic violence. As someone who works to prosecute domestic violence cases, do you feel the systems in place are adequate? I believe that the systems that are in place are full of a lot of people and a lot of people that really care and a lot of people that really want to stop um, domestic violence from happening. As all things dealing with humans, there's going to be um, unfortunate uh, issues that need to be done better. And again, uh, this is hopefully going to be something that that helps the sheriffs and the police and everybody involved to try and make sure that we're adequately supporting victims. You know, in your view, are there places where the system can be tighter in its protection of domestic violence survivors? Well, that's, that's a really big question, and I, I just I want to make sure that I stay in my lane because uh, as a prosecutor, we become involved with cases after arrests have been made and after the case is set on a criminal court docket. We then present the facts to to the court and um, hold offenders accountable in that way. Um, speaking to the larger scope, I our office does work tightly with police in particular and um, the people that are the domestic violence detectives that we work with closely. Everybody uh, is working, again, to make sure that we are trying to support victims. I, on our team in general, we every time an arrest is made and, and that case hits a docket, we are contacting victims within hours of that arrest being made to make sure that they know that we are there for them. We're connecting them with services. We're making sure that we're listening to their voices and getting them the adequate services support and keeping them involved in all of the court uh, process. What's the, what's the response when you reach out to victims with that? It is, uh, it's usually right after an arrest. So I say that to say sometimes the victims are in the hospital. Sometimes they are in a state of uh, not really adequately being able to, to talk. Um, and I, But I will say the vast majority of the time, they're just happy that we care and they are happy to get the information that we're able to give them, trying to connect them with whatever it is, if they need shelter, if they need to use that 12-hour hold to be able to get away, to to, to find a safe place to, to be, um, to get counseling services, um, all of those things. I'd like to introduce my next guest. Sharon Roberson is the president and CEO of the YWCA of Nashville and Middle Tennessee, which operates the largest dedicated domestic violence shelter in the state. Sharon, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Now, you work to help domestic violence survivors. And I'm wondering, what's your reaction to the story we heard earlier about Marie Varsos? First of all, it's, it's very heartbreaking when we lose uh, someone to domestic violence that was doing all the things that the public says that you should do. How many times have we heard you, just, you should just leave? But we know that when you leave is when you're most at danger. So it's very heartbreaking. As we heard earlier, there were four bills proposed in the legislature to establish more protections for survivors of domestic violence. 
Only one of those has made it to the governor's desk, SB 2746, which would require anyone serving a summons or other civil process to determine if the person being served has an outstanding criminal warrant. Sharon, I want to get your reaction to those proposed laws. Do you think they could make a difference? Well, first of all, the law that is on the governor's desk can make a difference, but it really is the minimum that I think that individuals in our society that are victims of domestic violence should ask of the public. It almost goes without saying. I will say the GPS monitoring bill is a very, very good bill. We do believe as advocates for victims and survivors that they should be able to feel safe in the community once they have made a claim of domestic violence. The reason for this is you should not have to walk around looking over your shoulder once you have been assaulted by an individual. Alex Yawn had mentioned that the usage of a GPS device, he believes, if, if that were in play, he, his mother and his sister would still be here. And let me ask, if you could strengthen the laws around domestic violence, what would you want to see? First of all, I think the use of GPS monitoring and some form of notification to victims when offenders are released is a minimum. I think that that will go a long way towards saving lives because if you have the opportunity to get out of danger, then that is very important. Uh, second of all, I do believe that there should be more education. We were very fortunate to have bipartisan support of legislation where uh, cosmetologists and barbers are now required to have education for domestic violence. They are not required to report, but this arms our community with advocates and individuals that can provide information to individuals who are victims of domestic violence. Uh, I will say the GPS monitoring is very, very important. And I would say that also allowing for victims to have support in all aspects of the criminal justice system when they make a claim of domestic violence. You know, Christina, you were quoted in that piece talking about those GPS monitors. You said you had not seen them put on domestic violence cases. Why is that? I, I, that's that's a great question. It is not something, and I can only I can't speak to the why. I can just say it is not something that I have seen ordered by a magistrate or a judge in my time at the DA's office. If I was to guess, I would say maybe it's financial in nature. Um, but all I can say is that I have not seen it. It has not been something that I have seen required. So this order is up to a magistrate, but can they be suggested, perhaps by your office or someone else? They, yes, absolutely can um, and have been. I have not seen one ordered. Okay. You know, if you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kalio Lekalona. We're talking this hour about domestic violence. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, or if you're not sure your situation is domestic violence, you can talk to an advocate at the Family Safety Center. That number is 615-880-1100. That's 615-880-1100. I'd like to introduce my next guest. Anita Smith is a survivor of domestic violence, and she joins us now. Anita, thank you for being here. Thank you, and good morning to you. You know, I know that this is a very, very personal topic for you, and you worked hard to free yourself from years of abuse. Did the system work for you? Uh, In former years, I'm 58 years old, and um, I started experiencing domestic violence under 18 years old. So um, up until 2009, did I have some extreme relationships, and the system did not work. Um, It was only up until 2009 that I was able to uh, be free from that domestic violence. But um, over and over again... Uh, order protections uh, from Davidson County to Sumner County to Kentucky. Uh, it just didn't work. You know, Sharon, you're hearing from Anita there. How does that resonate with you? I, I, I understand what she's saying. We have been providing domestic violence services at the YWCA for over 40 years. And during that time, we've learned a lot. 
but we also know that there are shortcomings because people do not understand the cycle of domestic violence. They do not understand the psychological, emotional, and often financial constraints on an individual that an abuser can use. And so it does not surprise me that she has found that she has not been able to receive the support that was necessary in this community. So Anita, what was the most difficult part in navigating the system for you? Um, I'd like to say this to Sharon. Um, I went through your uh, program, and it was, like I said, and I thank God for you all being there, but I had been through the uh, the shelter several times and other shelters, and it was just until I really started applying uh, what was being taught and uh, by the counselors in the shelter in here in Nashville that I start understanding about myself and um, just the things that are on the um, the power and control wheel alone uh, teaches individuals about the different methods of violence. Um, if if I might just run some of them down. Please. Um, the power and control wheel, you could pull it up off the Internet, but it uh, speaks about physical violence and sexual violence. Use the, the perpetrator using intimidation, using emotional abuse, using isolation, minim, minimizing, denying, and blaming, using the children, using male privilege, using economic abuse, and using coercion and threats. And until I start understanding that, and I have been through different shelters, but I never did apply anything. And uh, through a support system, I was, like I said, in 2009, able to be free from those um, grips of domestic violence. Now, you know, Anita, you mentioned you had m multiple orders of protection. So that sounds like the system is working. Why do you think it kept failing for you? Um, following through. Uh, it used to be um, back in the day when I talk about a, a 40 year span or, or so. It used to be back in the day that the woman and speaking of myself would not show up to court. And there it went. The same perpetrators out there again, and a lot of times uh, getting back into relationships. It happened with me several times. I went back to the person, no matter how uh, bad the situation was. I went back to it uh, because I was accustomed to that behavior. And once again, uh, you have to learn uh, different things about um, the whys uh, in these relationships and be very safe at doing that. But um, the system didn't work uh, with one particular relationship because he had inside help with the police station. Uh, and it was amazing, but they never did prosecute, never did prosecute. So you have to follow through. You have to really follow through, and you have to do it with um, someone within the domestic violence advocacy, um, whether it be the court system or shelter, the uh, key thing is one of the things that uh, the why, um, if you call the hotline, they say, are you safe? Uh, let's develop a safe plan to get out. Now, Sharon, how does that how does that resonate with you? Well, I'm glad that we do have a 24 hour crisis line. And what she is saying is essential. One is that if you choose to make a change, you need to do it safely because oftentimes people want to leave when they are very angry and they say, I'm done with this. But that can be a very dangerous time. And so we have a 24-hour crisis line, and that line can be used by a victim of domestic violence or by any member of the community that wants to help a victim of domestic violence or really determine whether or not something you're suspicious uh, of being domestic violence is that. But one of the things that she brings up is working with individuals in this space. Work with a counselor at the Family Safety Center or someone at the YW via the crisis line to really better understand your circumstance because you may not even realize that you are in a domestic violence relationship. Christina, I saw that you wanted to ch chime in and jump in. Well, I just wanted to, to thank Anita for speaking about the power and control wheel because and talking about uh, 
people not showing up for court. And I, I just want to make it clear that the, a lot of the reason why people don't show up for court is because of that power and control wheel, mm. because the abuser is using one of those many tools to pressure them into not prosecuting. And I, and I do want to say this problem is um, it, is sometimes a lot worse for people who are new to the country, who may not speak the language. Um, and uh, it's important for us to make sure that we connect with them as well as as part of, of this community of people that care. Uh, when, when we at the DA's office call victims you, after an arrest, we always ask, are you safe? Mm -hmm. We also work with the YW if, if there is a need to. Sometimes I'm on the phone with, with uh, somebody who, who has just been abused and they tell me, no, they're not safe, safe. And I'm on my cell phone texting somebody, can we connect them with services? So, mm -hmm. so, so we're always going uh, above and beyond to try and make sure that, number one, we're keeping our community members safe. And I will say here at the Davidson County Courthouse, we also have a branch of the Family Safety Center uh, which was just mentioned, inside the courthouse. So if you are in court or you're meeting with a DA, we can always immediately not send you somewhere else. We can help you right there in the courthouse. Christina, you're the lead prosecutor in domestic violence cases. What do you think most people misunderstand or what they simply don't know about this topic? Well, I will say, um, as far as prosecution is concerned, I think that uh, a lot of people don't know what is meant by the word prosecute. Mm. Um, so we, a lot of times, want to make sure that we are having that conversation with people who are survivors of domestic violence. What does that mean to you? Um, we hear all the time, I don't want, you know, my husband, boyfriend, you know, significant other in jail. Okay, well, what would work for you? Well, you know, if he could be on, on a monitoring or a GPS or on probation or get mental health treatment or drug addiction treatment, that would be the best outcome. So I think communicating and making sure that we have an open voice. Women, or I say women, people who have been in, in domestic violence uh, relationships have had their voice put on mute for so long. They haven't had a voice. They haven't been able to say, this is what I want. They haven't had to have autonomy. Mm. They, they, and so I, as a prosecutor, and our office as, as, as an office that prosecutes, we don't want to be another abuser to this person. Mm -hmm. We don't want to tell them, no, this is what's going to happen. You don't have a voice again. We're not going to be part of that. So we are always making sure that we are communicating with, with people and making sure that the resolution is the appropriate one for that particular case. That is Christina Johnson, Davidson County Assistant District Attorney. Thank you for being with us today. Sharon Robeson and Anita Smith are hanging with us through the break. Thanks for tuning in for this rebroadcast of our episode that first aired last April. When we come back, we will talk with a panel about what the work of protecting and supporting domestic violence survivors looks like and what the public should know about the resources available. We'll be right back. This is Nashville. Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Tennessee has one of the highest rates in the country of women killed by men. Today, we're talking about domestic violence and what can be done to improve outcomes for survivors. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, or if you're not sure if your situation is domestic violence, you can talk to an advocate at the Family Safety Center. That number is 615 880 1100. Again, 615 880 1100. My next guest is Mary Catherine Rand, Executive Director of the Mary Parish Center. Mary Catherine, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Can you tell us, tell me a little bit more about the work you do at the Mary Parish Center? Sure, absolutely. Um, so at the Mary Parish Center, we are really focused on housing. And so we provide um, transitional housing and rapid rehousing, which is permanent housing, and support services to survivors of interpersonal violence. Can you tell me how the current state of affordable housing affects your mission? Uh, 
Um, it, well, it, it affects everything um, that we do. Um, I mean, the whole goal is to be able to really um, provide a safe space for survivors um, and, you know, provide them with those support services. Um, but with kind of the state of affordable housing in Nashville, it's very difficult um, to find housing that is affordable. Um, and that, I mean, that is the goal. That is the goal with every single person that steps through our door um, is to gain and maintain that permanent housing. Um, so with really kind of um, the state of everything, it's, it, it's very challenging. Sharon Roberson of the YWCA is still with us. Sharon, along those lines, you run the largest domestic violence shelter in the state. How much room do you have and how long can people stay? Well, that is, I think, one of the focal points of what the YW is advocating for. Presently, we have a 65-bed shelter, and depending on the configuration of a family, you can be full at 40, you can be full at 80, uh, because we do have some family rooms. With that said, because of the demand, so to speak, uh, individuals are only allowed to stay in shelter for 60 days, and that is a not enough time, we work very hard, but when you've suffered significant trauma, especially when you have children you're caring for, 60 days is not nearly enough. Uh, but we are an emergency shelter, and so we work very closely to see if we can transition those that come into shelter as quickly as possible. How long is your waiting list? Well, we don't have a waiting list per se. Individuals, if we do not have room, will come back and call us and keep calling us until a uh, room opens up on um, critical situations, especially those that are part of the Lethality Assessment Program, which is a program between the Family Safety Center, Metro Nashville Police Force, and the YWCA, where there are critical cases that the police officers find where an individual's life can be in danger at a later date based on a questionnaire they ask on the spot, we do find spaces, even if we have to move toward hoteling. Now, as 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 Mary was was breaking that down, Anita, I saw you. I saw you nod your head when she said, "You know, sixty five days is not enough." And being someone who has survived this, talk to me about like that time. You said that it's been years before you were able to be helped. Talk to me about this time, like someone who is going in to try to find services and the length of time that, that is available to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. For myself, uh, going into the shelter, um, like I said earlier, I have been in the shelter system several times, but never really applying what was learned because they do have a curriculum for each individual uh, once they are in the shelter. And uh, just going in there, it takes time to try to uh, go. A lot of times uh, women leave with the clothes on their back, and that's all they have. Uh, a lot of times they don't have uh, the proper identification, um, Social Security cards. In fact, I didn't have a Social Security card uh, after getting a counselor um, with this last time that I was there at the YWCA shelter, um, I was sent uh, to a benevolent program at the uh, downtown Presbyterian Church, and I was able to get um, that particular program to pay for a, a ID. A, um, it was a state ID, not the Social Security card. I, my apologies. But... Um, there are so many things missing, and just to assess a person, those days pass by fast, and um, it just takes time for the healing, the healing process, and just to find affordable housing, that's almost obsolete, um, and we are prioritized because we are in the shelter, uh, being homeless. Um, my way of escape, I became... Um, well, I started uh, selling the contributor newspaper, and one thing led to another as I applied myself with that, and I was uh, had money and resources to get into apartment complex and went from apartment complex to a house. And um, 
later lost my way again, but I was able to do something with what I had. Sharon, let me ask, how often are you all at capacity at your shelter? Well, we stay, uh, especially during COVID, at capacity because we've had to limit some of the rooms that had shared space because of COVID. Uh, Prior to COVID, we stayed pretty full. However, what we do is, I said, work at all the resources in the community. There are other people, uh, other organizations with shelters that we send people to. But we have uh, at times been told by our governmental partners that we are turning away too many people. And we've really prioritized very um, uh, the worst of situations because of that. We would hope that we could tackle some of these, I hate to say lesser, but not as critical cases. And we could do that with more room, but we do have to have the space for those who are the most lethal of cases. I want to ask about COVID because as the pandemic came in, one of the main concerns was people are going to be forced to quarantine with their abusers. You know, uh, Sharon and and, and Mary Catherine, I want to hear from both of you about that. As the pandemic has been abating and things have, you know, temporarily changed for us all, what did you see coming out of the pandemic as far as uh, domestic violence survivors and their need for help? Mary Catherine. Sure. Um, So one thing that we really saw is um, an increase in high-risk cases. And so um, we were really beginning to work with survivors um, during the pandemic um, that were in these very high risk and lethal situations. So that's really kind of the the first thing that we saw. Um, Then once people were in our housing programs, we began to see um, higher needs. So a lot of people were losing their jobs because of COVID. Um, and then in like permanent housing, they then were not able to pay their rent. Um, so we really had to um, kind of fundraise to be able to sustain survivors more than we even normally do. Um, and then really kind of the last thing that we saw was um, an increase in um, mental health issues. Um, and so survivors that Um, really needed kind of some more intense counseling um, because of that time that they they had had at home with their abusers, Um, you know, when they were not able to leave, um, when they were isolated, became depressed, um, and really kind of had an increase in those PTSD symptoms. Sharon, same question to you. What changes have you seen? Uh, Well, our initial indicators were were with our crisis line. Initially, within weeks, we had an 80, and then it leveled off to 55% increase in the number of calls to the crisis line. Also, what we saw were the cases coming into shelter were much, much more violent. Uh, If you were looking at a situation that would increase domestic violence, it would be COVID. Uh, Individuals were at home. There were a lot of, of financial stressors. Children were no longer in school. We didn't. We no longer had the community oversight to see if a person was all right. People lost their church families. They lost their school families. And so it has been a substantial increase in domestic violence. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kaliole Colonna. We're talking this hour about domestic violence. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic violence, or if you're not sure your situation is domestic violence, you can talk to an advocate at the Family Safety Center. That number is 615-880-1100. Again, that is 615-880-1100. You know, Anita, sometimes we hear that someone who is experiencing domestic violence should just get up and leave their abuser. But you live this. Is it really so simple? Oh, no. No, that that's a myth. Um, so many things are tied into that. If ch- children in, are involved, um, earlier I did uh, read some of the cycles of the domestic violence uh, power and control wheel, and uh, using economic abuse is one of the things uh, that's on there um, from the batterer, and it's it's just not that easy. A lot of shame and guilt. 
uh, comes into play. You don't want to tell anybody, um, and it's it can be detrimental. And one of the things is I never told anybody. I kept it to myself for the longest. How were you able to finally get free? Um, I reached out. I reached out, uh, as I was saying earlier in the segment, that I uh, became um, a contributor newspaper vendor. And one of the places that um, I was posted up selling my newspaper is the Davidson County Courthouse. And I thought to myself, I said, God, you really got a sense of humor. I said, I don't want to uh, stay here. A lot of the people are shrewd and and they're on a mission. They're either going into the courthouse to for one thing or another. They're not interested in, in me selling uh, the paper. And I later just continued to stay there at that position because I felt like, well, you know, I needed to be there. It's a reason. It's a purpose. Well, I became friends with some of the attorney generals, uh, some of the uh, judges, uh, criminal uh, attorneys, uh, two particular uh, attorneys. Uh, one day, as they we had befriended each other, would would carry on conversation like you carry on with your friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anita, how you doing today? And I had had a, a, a weekend prior to that with just a, a lot of domestic violence. And this particular person was a sexual predator. And so I was just choked up. And uh, I started sharing. I shared with that person. Then another criminal uh, attorney uh, shared with that person. They helped me uh, with my self-esteem. Um, one particular uh criminal attorney, he uh, set up a counseling session with his church, and I got empowered. And um, and so through that and through my last time staying at the YWCA, getting a counselor and understanding the power wheel and applying the power, w- power wheel, and I've always had a, a um, spiritual life of prayer and believing God uh, that— um, I was going to be free from it, um, the grips of it. Um, there was so many things that happened. And this particular, I'll never forget, uh, on a Saturday night, this perpetrator, um, there was some sexual abuse, there was some physical violence, emotional violence all night long into the wee hours of Sunday morning. And this uh, person was an addict as well, and he went to go buy drugs the next morning and said that he was coming back to continue. And I knew that I was breaking, and I I was like, I can't deal with this no more. Something has got to happen today because I will not allow him to continue to abuse me like this. Well, thank God I had a friend, and I called that friend, and uh, she came over right away, and she was very encouraging and sympathetic, and she said, let's call the police. He can't continue to do this to you. She had never known because I kept it from her, and we we had a 25-year friendship, Mm. and I kept it from her. But that day I called the police, and God bless me. They sent the right police out. And I never, I will never forget. And hopefully, throughout uh, anybody listening, maybe uh, they pull up the case, they might find out who the officer was that was sent out. I told them about the history of this batterer. And I said, well, he's on his way back. And I got nervous. And I said, uh, he's going to run if he sees your police car. This officer said, what is his telephone number? I never forget, and I didn't know what he was getting ready to do. I was like, okay, maybe he's just ch- charting it. He called the batterer, and he asked for his first name, and he, the batterer, said, "Hey, this is him." Just like that, I have to break it down to y'all, uh, just how it happened. And he said, "This is Officer So and So, So and So," and I'm serving you notice that you need to appear in court. It was in July, I believe it was July the 7th of that year. Mm. And I was blown away. I was blown away, Khalil. I was blown away. And uh, I never looked back. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, this is really, it's about community support and family. And I want to ask, you know, what should, Sharon, what should, what can bystanders do to help out when we see family and friends in this type of situation? Thank you so much for that question. First of all, you must educate yourself about the cycle of domestic violence, just like she has talked about, because that will help you understand what your friend or loved one is going through. You can call the YWCA crisis line 1-800-334-4628. That is Sharon Roberson. She was joined by Mary Catherine Rand and Anita Smith. Thank you all for being here today. Truly appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in for this brief broadcast. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode was produced by Paige Flager. Our senior producer is Steve Harouche. Our digital producer is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tutho. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other. <laughs>